This video talks about renal physiology. But there is a small section on top of the beginning of renal physiology which talks, which talks about the ureters. So I'd like to just get over it and move on to renal physiology after. So whenever we study the ureters or the anatomy of the ureter, uh, we know that ureter uh, kind of passes below the uterine artery. So imagine that this is our uterine artery, uterine artery. And underneath that, we have the ductus deferens, okay, ductus deferens. Um, and underneath that, we have the ureter, okay, ureter. So you, the functioning of the ureter is un, under the uterine artery and the ductus deferens. So I just wanted to uh, mention that. Also, ureter is a retroperitoneal structure. There's a mnemonic uh, to remember the retroperitoneal structure, and it's called sad pucker. Okay, the PU is ureter. Okay, but since we're talking about one retroperitoneal structure, let's talk about all retroperitoneal structure. So S is suprarenal, so the adrenal. Okay, A is going to be aorta and IVC, inferior vena cava. D is going to be for ductus deferens. P is going to be for pancreas except the tail part so except tail C is going to be for colon ascending plus descending but not transverse K is going to be for kidney E is going to be for esophagus the lower two-thirds so lower two-thirds and R is going to be for rectum and that's going to be the upper one third. So these are all the retroperitoneal structure and ureter is one of them. So now I'm ready to move on to renal physiology and the beginning of renal physiology which starts with fluid compartments. Now the fluid compartment is beautifully done on renal physiology and I will include a lot more information here because this part could be really really high yield. Now Fluid compartments, if you divide them broadly, you have to start off with the total body mass. So imagine that this is the total body mass. The total body mass can be divided into two sections, 40% actual mass and 60% fluid mass. Okay? Now this 60% can again be divided into two more sections, and they're going to be intracellular and extracellular. So this is going to be one-third and two-thirds. One-third is going to be extracellular, where two-thirds is going to be intracellular. Let me just change the orientation because for the ease of you know, my drawing later on in the graph. So um, I made the same mistake. So this is going to be two-thirds, and this is going to be one-third. And this is going to be extracellular fluid. Uh, and this is going to be intracellular fluid and this line should be closer to here okay. now we're going to further divide our extracellular fluid into two more sections okay we're going to further divide into two more sections and those two more sections is going to be plasma volume and interstitial volume so plasma volume is going to be uh, one fourth is going to be plasma volume, and three fourth is going to be interstitial volume. The plasma volume can be measured with albumin, and interstitial volume can be measured with inulin. Okay, so so far so good, right? It's not that hard. Now I will be talking about a lot more things based on this particular diagram. So usually what happens is in question uh, they are more interested about extracellular fluid and intracellular fluid. So they're really interested in this compartment. Most of the time, I'm not saying this is the only thing that's tested, but most of the time this is the box they're going to test. And it's usually drawn like this. This is going to be the intracellular fluid, the bigger box, and this is going to be the extracellular fluid, the smaller box. So the x-axis of this box, or this direction, this is going to be 
the volume. This is going to represent volume. And the y-axis kind of is determined as concentration. Okay. Now, question number one. How will this diagram change for someone who is sweating? So when someone is sweating, what happens is they're going to lose volume. But what kind of volume are they going to lose? They're going to lose hypotonic volume. Okay? They're going to, first of all, they're going to lose volume from the extracellular fluid. So this will go down. Okay? But they're losing hypotonic volume. As a result, what's going to happen to the concentration of the, of the extracellular fluid? It's going to go up. Right? Concentration is going to go up. And since concentration is in this area is going to go up, Fluid is going to rush from the intercellular fluid to the extracellular fluid. So there is going to be volume loss in the extracellular fluid as well. And the curve will shift like so. So for sweating, this is going to be the kind of picture we are going to see. Now my next question is, how would it look like for someone who has diabetes insipidus? For someone who has diabetes insipidus, what happens? Their kidney is not functioning. The collecting duct, the ADH receptors are not, um, not functioning. So what's going to happen to their urine? The urine is going to be hypotonic, right? Again, they're going to lose hypotonic fluid from the extracellular. Again, this is the same kind of scenario is going to happen. The point is you're going to lose hypotonic, uh, whatever means, that will give you hypotonic loss of fluid is going to give you that kind of change in this volume concentra concentration compartment changes. Now this kind of pattern of loss is also seen in alcoholism. In alcoholism we are also going to lose hypotonic urine. Okay? Hypotonic urine. Alright, so that was scenario number, scenario number one. Let's talk about scenario, scenario number two. Scenario number two is what if you have hemorrhage? And let's say you start off with a compartment like so. So what is hemorrhage? Hemorrhage is when you lose isotonic volume from the extracellular fluid. So the only change that's going to happen is this. This is what's going, what's hemorrhage going to look like. Okay. This is going to be our hemorrhage. So that's uh, scenario number two. Number three is going to be ingestion of table salts. So what happens if you ingest table salts? The concentration is going to go up, right? And if the concentration goes up, then volume is going to move from the intracellular fluid to extracellular fluid. So there's going to be volume loss in here. But the concentration, the overall concentration is going to rise and there's going to be increased volume in the extracellular fluid. So you're going to have something like that for ingestion of table salts. 